Well, thank you so much for being with us, Jose Hernandez, today. Um, you know, you have a new book coming out, and, and in this book you talk about your story, yes. starting out as a migrant farm worker and then becoming an astronaut, and now you're running for Congress. That's correct. Tell me a little bit more about your background and, and how you started out. Well, I, I started off as a, uh, what I would call, a, a characterized as a typical migrant farm worker. Uh, and uh, and basically what we did is the uh, even though I was born here in the United States I was born to uh, immigrant parents and we would go back for three months at a time back to my parents home state of Michoacan in Mexico and then we would spend nine months here in the United States following the harvest of the crop in the San Joaquin Valley of California and uh, it wasn't until a second grade teacher basically told my parents that we needed to stay in one place that we started making Northern California our home. And that's when our education started to get traction. And, uh, and, and uh, we started to get, you know, excellent grades. And, uh, and then, you know, unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember the tail end of the Apollo program. So I remember quite vividly uh, Gene Cernan walking on the surface of the moon, the uh, last man that has ever walked on the surface of the moon, by the way, 1972. Apollo 17, and uh, I remember I was hooked after seeing that, holding the rabbit ear antennas mm -hmm. uh, while I was watching the images of uh, Gene Cernan walk on the surface of the moon. I said, this is this is exactly what I, I want to be. I want to be an astronaut, and uh, it, it took off from there. So then tell me what it was like, those moments when you first got the call from NASA that you were selected as an astronaut. Well, you know, the, uh, the newness of NASA had worn off a bit because uh, back in 2000, I was in the final round for the second time, final round of 100, and I didn't get selected. But the consolation prize was they said, hey, why don't you come and work at NASA as an engineer, and uh, we'll, we'll check you out, be a good way of checking you out from close. And then uh, maybe when they do another selection, you'll be in a better position. No guarantees, but they said, hey, you know, it can't hurt. And I said, okay. So I went to work for NASA between 2001 and the next election round, which was 2004. Then I, uh, I was actually a branch chief of the materials and processes branch at NASA Johnson Space Center in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Houston when, uh, when I got the call and, you know, got the call in my office saying that, you know, they basically told me, did I... Uh, Am I replaceable? And I, I think the correct answer is everybody's replaceable. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, good, because uh, we want you to join the astronaut corps. And that was the best call I've ever received. Mm -hmm. So, so okay, your first space flight, the space yeah. shuttle mission, STS-128. What's that like? To it, it's just amazing. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, there's four of us in the, in the flight cabin and three in the uh, mid-deck. And the four of us in the flight cabin are the ones that have flight responsibilities. I was the uh, flight engineer. I sit right behind the commander who sits in front of me to my left, and then the pilot in front of me to the right, and I'm smack in the mi middle, you know, basically uh, hawking all the instruments. I have to have view of all the instruments as flight engineer. And there we are sitting, getting ready to launch, and, uh, you know, about four seconds to launch, uh, you start hearing a gentle noise, the rumble of three engines light up, you feel a gentle vibration. Two seconds later, you know, you close your visor, turn on your oxygen, and all of a sudden you hear the solid rocket boosters light up. You hear those, and those are, I mean, the order of magnitude louder than the three engines. The vibration is more violent. It's like, you know, I always characterize it as your big brother shaking you. <laughs> and mind you, you have your helmet, so the helmet's shaking like crazy in there. And then, uh, and then just when you think the whole thing's going to fall apart, you feel a push in your back, and that's the liftoff portion of it. You see the, uh, you, you, uh, you see the tower stay behind as you rise up, and it only takes eight and a half minutes to get up there. You go from zero miles an hour to 17,500 miles an hour. The G-forces start building up. You only get about three Gs, but right across your chest. And it starts off as if you got a little puppy on your chest. You know something's there, but doesn't bother you. But as you keep going faster and faster and build up the Gs, that little puppy grows into like a big giant St. Bernard. Mm. And so there's, there's a, a fair amount of pressure on your chest. It's harder to breathe, harder to expand your chest. And then at about the eight and a half minute mark, you reach Miko, main engine cutoff. You know, you turn the corner and the forces go away, the engines shut off, 
and now you're kind of loosey-goosey in your seat because you're in a microgravity environment, but your seatbelt's still holding you onto your seat. So it's just, uh, you know, I, the way I characterize this, I like to tell people it's the best e-ticket ride uh, Disneyland could ever hope to offer. <laughs> What's sort of surprised you when you were actually in space about the experience? You know, I think a lot. Of, you know, the very basic stuff surprised me because they don't. You know, they prepare you for all this advanced stuff in terms of doing the experiments and doing this and doing that, and uh, and and you never actually prepare for the very basic stuff. I remember when I was uh, when I was training, I was always. Um, you know, we were in the mock-ups. And the mock-ups are look lifelike, like real inside the uh, the space shuttle. And you know, we work at removing panels and stuff like that, maintenance stuff. And they teach us. And then on the floor, you see some sort of loops, some belt loops that are taped over with gray tape. And uh, and you're always tripping over them. And I'm always saying, God, why why are these things even here and all that? And you never think about it when you're training and everything. And then finally, uh, you go up in space and it's your turn to do maintenance and stuff like that. And there you are, kind of somewhat floating. You have a screwdriver in your hand, and you say, okay, now I'm gonna start start uh, to take off this panel, right? So you innocently put the screwdriver in the screw head and you start torquing it. Well, in space, for, for every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Same here in Earth, but remember, I'm not, sit, I'm not standing up anymore. I'm kind of free floating. So as I twist one way, my body torques the other way, mm -hmm. right? So it's a self-correcting thing that you say, oh. And then you look down and you see those loops. Oh, okay, I guess I'm supposed to put my feet in here mm -hmm. and then do it so I can brace myself. So it's those little things are the things that surprise you. Yeah. Do you have a, a moment that sticks out from your experience as being the, the highlight? I think so. I think, I think the moment that, that sticks out to me is just watching the sunrises and sunsets, particularly the sunrises. There was a minute, uh, a moment uh, when I had a few minutes uh, to spare during a sunrise. Here we are on the dark side coming over to the light side and the sun's coming out on the other side of the earth. And then for a split few seconds, you know, the, the rays of the sun hit the atmosphere, the earth at the right right angle you're able to see the whole thickness of your atmosphere here and I and what it saw me surprised me a lot I said you know because I said my gosh I said you know it's scary thin and to think that that's the only thing that are keeping humans and everything alive down here uh, it looked like a very delicate balance and I became an instant environmentalist I think I was already environmentalist but it only solidified my position in saying that you know we ought to become good stewards of our environment and I promised myself anytime I gave a talk related to my uh, space uh, flight that's the one plug I would give to everybody is that we need to take care of our environment because I saw it firsthand how delicate it looks and uh, if we're to leave this uh, planet in as good condition or better than when we found it we need to uh, you know, watch our carbon footprint. Watch, you know, you know, commute together. We ought to make sure we recycle and not pollute our air. Those type of things. Space.com.